Hello everybody, we are going to start again, um, so please take your seats and uh, I'm going to welcome to the stage four people. So we have Matt and Dan and Laura and Roger, who are all going to talk to you about the quality of your home for the next session. Thank you. Hello. Is the microphone on? No? Yep. Cool. So let's wait for a couple to take their seats somehow. <clears throat> so yeah, so good afternoon everybody uh, here today and those watching uh, online. Uh, we're delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you today about our service and how we'll be using the Social Housing Charter to help customers, uh, allow customers to help shape our service and uh, give us a chance to talk about some of the things that we're working on and some of the improvements we're looking to make within our service as well. My name's Daniel Owen, I'm the Director of Reactive Repairs. I've been with Curo for the last nine years, um, working in various positions in the repair service um, and in July I was appointed to the Director of the service. I'm joined on stage with Laura who will introduce herself shortly and then we'll take you through a short uh, PowerPoint presentation before we hand over to Matt and Roger. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Laura Strachan. I have recently been appointed in August to the Repairs Contracts Manager post, looking after our Repairs Contracts Works. Um, so today Dan and I will be taking you through the team and the repairs in numbers, so some statistics over the last year to share with you, uh, the COVID impact and what that's meant for our repair service. I'm going to be talking specifically about customers and how we're listening and how you guys are being heard. Dan will then take you through our service improvements and specifically a project he's been working on over the last year, which is our Agile Repairs project on our in-house DLO. And then Dan will also be taking you through the first time fix and how technology is being used uh, to accommodate this. Thanks, Laura. So uh, first of all, um, I thought I'd put some uh, faces to the uh, names you've probably uh, heard. So this is our reactive, our reactive repairs management team on the left-hand side. So we've got three repair team leaders, uh, Will, Adam and Christian. They look after all an internal, uh, internally employed trade staff. And then we've got Phil, who is our electrical team leader that looks after our electrical uh, team. And Laura, as mentioned, looks after all our subcontractor teams. Um, with our team, we've got, uh, we, our, team, our service, sorry, looks after all our reactive repairs work, excluding gas. Um, this is achieved through a team of 44 trade operatives. We have uh, over 10 external subcontractors, four project surveyors and three support, uh, support team officers. Along with the gas team last year, we completed uh, 33,000 repairs uh, with an additional 5,000 repairs being completed by our subcontracted team. Of the repairs that we have completed uh, last year, our, our in-house service was given a customer satisfaction score of 91% and our subcontractor uh, team were given a score of 77%. So there was some really good information and feedback from customers on how we can improve that service for our customers. I'll be talking in a moment around the impact of COVID, uh, but just to say that as well, that 100% of our emergency uh, uh, repairs were attended uh, the same day. In terms of the impact of, of COVID, like many teams, our service was impacted uh, as a result of this. We had two periods of locked, two periods of restricted service. Um, where we put a lot of our urgent jobs on, on uh, sorry, we, we uh, undertook urgent jobs and, and put our non-urgent jobs on, uh, on hold. We were still receiving repair requests during that period of time, so that meant that we had an additional thousand repairs added to our order book. It wasn't all doom and gloom within the service as we were still carrying out urgent repairs and also our external repairs. Um, I, think, I think now's the time just to pause to say thank you for customers as well for your patience during this period of time and also for helping to keep yourselves and our colleagues safe when we were working within your homes. Another impact that uh, customers would have felt uh, throughout this was we had a lower than average uh, colleague availability. Uh, the impact of this was that customers had, uh, would potentially have appointments moved and this was as a re result of our trade colleagues maybe having to self-isolate through track and trace and other government advice. So, um, yeah, do apologise for any uh, disturbance that was caused during that period of time. The good news is we've got a plan in place now to recover our service back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, by the end of March, Vic touched on this uh, yes, uh, yesterday, 
Uh, this will mean the customers won't have to wait so long for our non-urgent repairs. And we have more flexibility in the diary to, uh, to avoid having to move appointments as well, which is something we hate having to do. We're tackling this in three ways. Firstly, our existing uh, trade colleagues are working additional hours um, over time to achieve this. We're also going to be bringing in some agency staff to allow us to have that additional resource uh, to complete more repairs. And we'll also be outsourcing some of our repairs to external contractors as well. And that will hopefully bring down the backlog of repairs of around a, a, a thousand additional repairs back to pre-COVID levels of around 2,200 by the end of uh, March. So Laura's now going to take you through the, uh, the slide regarding customers being heard. Okay, so we're always looking for opportunities to listen to our customers and our, some of our current ways in which we do that at the moment is through our customer engagement groups and also what I've been lucky enough to be a part of, which is our scrutiny panel group, which I can see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, so thank you for coming along today. Um, for those who don't know, the scrutiny panel is a team of customers who work with a team that is recognised by the customer engagement group as an area for improvement. And I was lucky enough to be a part of this with the contracts team in repairs. It's 12 weeks of working with our customer panel uh, to analyse the op operational matrix, look at end-to-end uh, -end times, performance, processes. Um, there's nothing off the table. And it ultimately is to emphasize our areas of focus and improvements and be guided by our customers um, in our areas of focus and improvements to take things forward. Uh, the main areas of improvements we looked at during that time was around communication, quality assurance, customer expectation, and complaints. And our lovely customers were able to put forward some really exciting and really in-depth recommendations for this to take place. Um, I'm eager to share these with you, so please do keep an eye out for any memos or any polls that might be coming your way over the coming months as we start implementing some of the recommendations from our customers. So also, if you would like to join us um, in any of these groups, particularly the scrutiny group and the customer engagement group, please do get in uh, touch with our residency involvement team and they'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Thanks, Lord. Uh, so, yeah, service improvement. So in the last 12 months, as uh, Laura mentioned, I've, I've been working on, the, uh, on a project called the Agile Repairs Project. This has been to try and improve the service we provide to our customers. So we had an initial study phase whereby we went out over voice box and, uh, and asked our customer involvement group uh, and we studied the work to look at you know, what sort of things do you want to see improved within the service. And the aims then are on the left-hand side of the screen. So those were to improve productivity, uh, identify and remove black holes from within the service, get customers uh, back to a problem-free home quicker and uh, that was and also to create a culture of continuous improvement within the service so the, there's, there's some things we've already had done to address this at the moment and uh, those are listed on here as well so we've, we've wanted to reduce the travel time of our trade staff so a lot of the, the time spent by our trade staff was was around traveling to different areas maybe from Bath into Bristol back to Radstock then over to um, Melcham. So what we try to do is keep our trade staff within uh, designated areas and by doing that we've actually been able to reduce our travel time and mileage uh, per job which has then allowed us to, to spend more time on the repairs uh, work and through doing that we've actually seen a, uh, an increase in our productivity or jobs per day output of 8%, an 8% improvement in uh, jobs being completed per day which is fantastic. The second two points on there was around providing ownership and, and visibility of, of, uh, for, for our trade staff but also our, our back office team so we have now a single scheduler and a repair team leader that will have a designated area they manage so for example we uh, one of our repair team leaders uh, looks after the uh, Radstock area a mid of Norton area he has all that customer base and makes sure that every, every one of those customers are on, on his list to make sure that we follow those through rather than everybody looking after a bit of everything that gives clear ownership and visibility uh, going forward and that's something that we're working on introducing and, and rolling through now over the, over the coming months. We've got a uh, a new process of providing visibility to our customers. So we, we've got a uh, new program called a Kanban, which is a jargon term, but this is basically just a, a portal where we can visualize all our work. And that makes sure that we can identify any customers that don't have future appointments. So any customers that have more than one open repair um, on different appointment dates, we can try and um, attend those on one appointment date. So you only have to wait home once. And we also identify that we think we've got a, 
a, too much of a rigid or one size fits all approach. And realistically, what we need to do is tailor our approach to depend on the customer need. So now we now have much more variety at our disposal for our customer contact team to be able to use. And, and that will allow us then to uh, tailor our approach depending on the need of the customer. Finally, I want to talk about the first time fix. Um, the importance of this for us is that, is that we can come to a property and send the, the correct tradesperson for the correct amount of time to do that repair in one visit. That means you only have to wait home once to have that repair done. And when we come once, we'll do it rather than you having to wait several weeks for us to return again in the future. So we've got the phone option where you can, where you can report repairs and you can also report your repairs via uh, MyCuro. Uh, one thing we're trialling now at the moment is that we, we'd like to obtain as much information as possible and get as much information from you and ask the correct questions to ensure that we do get the correct tradesperson to, the, um, to, to your property for the correct amount of time more often than not. Something we've been trialling is video technology. So while having a conversation over the phone with you, we're able to actually have a, a live video link with you so you can clearly show us on your phone the, the repair in question. That helps on a couple of different levels. A, we've been able to actually um, resolve repairs over the phone, so we've been able to help by resetting boilers over the phone or resetting, safely resetting uh, trip switches, and that means you don't have to wait home for a repair at all. We can resolve that just o over the phone with you there and then. But also we can check the severity of a, of a problem, which means that we can, we can ass assess maybe a crack in the wall, see how big that crack is, or look at a, a, a kitchen unit and see the type of unit that is. So when we come, we've got more information armed so we can bring the correct product with us and make sure we complete that in a single visit. We've had some really good feedback from our customers on using this uh, video technology. It's something we're keen to explore further with our customer contact team. Again, it's not for everybody. It's not something we're going to force on people, but it's just another option that we can use to try and uh, uh, provide a tailored approach to customers that want to use that. And we'll continue to work with our customer contact team and yourselves to drive up, to look at other improvements of uh, moving things forward. So we, we ours is the uh, reactive repairs team. I'm now going to hand over to Matt, who's more on our plan side of things, who will be able to talk you through the uh, the asset management side. Good afternoon. I'm Matt, the director of asset management and procurement at Curo. I recognise a few of you out there, some friendly faces. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the impact of the Charter for Social Housing Residents uh, impact on plan maintenance and how we'll be undertaking improvements to your, your homes um, under the, the uh, plans they have for the review of the decent home standard. So the, one of the commitments the government made through the uh, Charter is to review the decent home standard. The decent home standard uh, outlines how Curo maintain your properties from uh, kitchens to bathrooms, windows, doors and heating systems. They outline the, the uh, frequency that they would expect us to be undertaking those upgrades and replacements and it also outlines uh, health and safety uh, requirements of your home and what would, what would be deemed a health and safety hazard. Okay. The decent home standards have been in place for around 20 years now and the commitment is that they're going to review that and that review started earlier this year and we expect that review to finish towards the back end of the autumn uh, uh, 2021. The number of the, the, the areas that they'll be reviewing under the decent home standard is, is what is important to you in your homes now through, through compiling the charter and, and the white paper that sets out the plans. They undertook a number of uh, consultations <clears throat> sorry, with, uh, with, with the public to understand what's important now and what should be reflected in this new, this new decent home standard. The areas that we anticipate being included are energy efficiency, as that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the big issue for us at the moment as, as <laughs> globally. Um, through the clean growth strategy that the government set out a few years ago, they set a number of targets and we expect the decent homes to align those targets with social housing providers where we need to achieve certain thermal efficiency and energy efficiency across your stock by 2030 and 2035. And then further down the road, but something we must be thinking about now is the decarbonisation of our stock too. A couple of other areas we anticipate being included in the review and in the new standard will be around security. That, that's, that's not present in the standard at the moment but security around the estate and, and, and the public places where you live, but also the green spaces will be 
will be included as well. I think what, what COVID and the lockdowns have highlighted is, is the need for people to have access to good quality leisurely spaces outdoors. Okay, so we'll touch on what we're doing under the current Decent Homes and how we're uh, delivering our programmes of work and what the plans we have uh, for that in the, the next 10 years. We'll touch on the work we're doing on en energy efficiency in a moment as well. Um, but Roger's going to uh, give you some uh, an overview of, of how COVID impacted our delivery last year. Okay. Hi, I'm Roger. Um, I work with Matt on the, on the plan side of on the delivery, on the components. Um, and, and I think it's just adding on to what Dan talked about, about everyone's been affected by COVID um, and we're no exception. And so I suppose last year um, when COVID really took grip, we, we had to rethink about how we went about things um, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously lockdown, um, it was a, a, a lot more difficult to, to actually arrange the works. Um, so we, we, we basically had a delayed start to our, our usual programme about six months. Um, as I say, that was due to lockdown, but also just trying to readjust as to what we, what we could do. Um, a, lot of our, our, a lot of our works are intrusive to a certain extent in people's properties, involving a number of operatives in the property at one time. And again, that was something that we, we couldn't do. Um, so there was a regime more of, of left people in the property. The work was taking longer to do, more cleaning down. Um, so it, it was just more planning needed. Um, so. As I say, the first six months, it, there was an awful lot of planning taking place. And it was something as a team that we've never come across before. Um, you know, we all project manage um, different, different projects, different work streams. But this was something we never, we never really, we've never planned for, to be quite honest. It was, a, it was an interesting time. Um, so that first six months went through. And then we started on, on the second six months, which, at which time we would planned. We had a little bit more of opening up and we were able to actually get into properties. Now, some of that work, to be quite honest, we rearranged. Um, some of the more intrusive things, like, um, say, a gas installation, where it was a boiler and a full system, we actually reduced the number we were doing in, the first, in that six months, and all we were doing was putting a lot of boilers in, so that was almost in and out of a property, less areas to move about in, less people needed. So there was quite a lot of thinking that went on with that. Um, we also increased the number of... Again, doors and windows. Um, doors and windows, again, are, are reasonably easy, quick fixes to do, less intrusive. Um, so that, that was a benefit. And actually, from our point of view, from where we started in the first six months, the second six months were a massive success, and all due to the team that worked on all this. They, they really did work hard, in addition to the contractors, because they were adjusting. They had all the same issues as us with people being out with, with COVID. Um, and as I say, from the, from the numbers on there, you can actually see that where I've just sort of highlighted, um, there are areas that we've really increased the numbers that we, we, that we plan to do. As a consequence, we ended up actually spending nearly three and a half million pounds on components, which again was really good. Another 1.4 on blocks, which is more um, blocks of flats. Again, work up to that external work was a lot easier to do, um, less intrusive, so we were able to do that and over 1,200 people of our customers actually benefited in component replacements. Um, and at the end of the day, from what we planned to do at the very beginning of the year, we actually delivered 87% of the components we thought we were going we to deliver. They might have been in a different structure, but that was the, the end result. So, as I say, at the end of the day, from a lot of hard work from a lot of people, it, it really did pay dividends. Um, so, yeah, it was a successful year in the end. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roger. Um, so, uh, Victor mentioned yesterday, this year, we've got record busting levels of investment, £24 million this year. Um, the the Cure Out summer have never, never seen investment like that. That's only going to continue to grow over the next 10 years. I th we we recognise that there are areas we haven't invested in enough in the past. Um, the, the year just, Roger just touched upon last year was a challenge. We, 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 we made a very, very strong effort of it and, and nearly got everything over the line. This year we are investing £24 million. That includes the property safety elements as well, which I think you heard from Mike Griss um, on yesterday. From the component replacements, your kitchens, bathrooms, windows, the, the block refurbishments, we have £138 million to spend in the next 10 years. That will include... 
Uh, we have 6,000 kitchens in the next 10 years, 4,000 bathrooms, 4,000 properties will have windows, 1,100 blocks will have refurbishments over the next 10 years also. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of this information is readily available to you on my Curo. so if you're interested to find out when we will be um, coming to knock on your door to inspect your, your kitchen or your bathroom with a view to replacing, you can, you can identify when all of those visits are due to take place in, in your online account. Okay. Moving on to how, how we perform, what, what, what do customers think of us? When I, when I joined Asset Management in 2018-19, not enough customers were happy with the improvements we were making to their home. Um, replacing a kitchen or a bathroom or windows or a heating system can, can be really disruptive, but it should be a really exciting time for you as well. I think, um, I, I, I know when I've, I had a kitchen replaced, I, I was tearing my hair out at the mess, but the, f the finished product you're, you're over the moon with, aren't you? We weren't getting that feedback. So we, uh, we made a case to Vic and the exec team say, guys, we need, we need to stop because we are just getting this wrong far too often. And we, we took a break and we uh, started customer journey mapping. So we started mapping out the process for the customer. OK, when do we make contact with the customer? Uh, what do they have to do? What effort are we asking of the customer for this process to take place? And so we invited customers in to work with us on giving us feedback on how their upgrade had, had, had taken place. What was the experience like? As a result, we took that feedback on board and we, we, we re-engineered our process. So we started introducing uh, more frequent touch points. We call customers more frequently when their kitchen's being ripped out. It's, it's, a, it's a concerning time. You, you, the kids are coming from school. You wanna, you wanna make them a pop noodle and you got no work top. It's, it's, it's stressful. So, so we give our customers uh, more phone calls. We, we make more contact just to check in and see how it's going. One of the overriding pieces of feedback we had was, you know, the process was okay, but we never seen or heard from Curo. So, so we, the team of surveyors now, they, they undertake pre-inspections of every single piece of work. They meet with the customer. They talk about what choices they have around tiling and flooring. They'll pop in whilst the work is going on as well, and they'll come and sign the work off. But the support team that we have in the back office will be making regular phone calls to check in, see how things are going. Some of the feedback we had was actually there are some customers that aren't quite as mobile as others and might need a little bit more assistance. So we've now introduced uh, things. Oh, we'll, we'll come around and, and we'll pack the kitchen up for you. you know, we'll, we'll pack things into boxes. We'll store it away tidily for you. Um, if, if we don't do that, some customers don't have anybody else to call upon to help them. And um, the... The result of all of this work is that we have, we've been able to move our customer satisfaction from 89% up to 94% in a couple of years' time. Now, we're going to be revisiting that customer journey again this year. We're going to be inviting customers that have recently had upgrades to give us additional feedback to see where else we need to take this, what more we need to do, because um, 94% is great, 94% isn't enough. So um, there will be some uh, invites going out on voice box to customers to provide us with feedback on, on the processes we've adopted. Okay. Another exciting uh, piece of work, which uh, Vic beat me to the punch yesterday again, is the, the energy efficiency work we've been uh, piloting this year. So we've got a photo there of the Qbot underfloor insulation. So I won't, I won't do this to death. Vic touched on it yesterday. This is uh, fully grant funded from the government to undertake an innovative uh, pilot to understand how we can improve the energy efficiency of some of our stock. The Net Zero Collective piece of work is <coughs> something we've been doing with Southampton University. Southampton University have installed a number of data loggers in different types of homes that we have. So we have some uh, historic properties, we have some more traditional properties, we have bungalows and blocks, and we've taken a, a sample of different uh, home types, installed data loggers to, to provide us with the data and information that tells us how much it may be uh, costing to run that property for the customer, how energy efficient it might be. And then we're taking that information. We just had the data come back last week. 
with a recommendation as to what measures these types of homes will need to achieve EPCC and to also be decarbonised. So we're now we're looking at that data and we're going to be installing some of those solutions based on the recommendations. The data loggers will go back in and then tell us what impact these measures are now having. So that's, that's another exciting piece of work. However, we, we, do have, um, we do have a bit of a gap in terms of our understanding as to how our stock performs. I say stock, apologies, how our homes, your homes perform from an energy efficiency perspective. So we will be undertaking a, a, a big programme of EPC uh, data collection across, across the homes to identify how each and every single home is performing to then understand what measures we need to start deploying over the next few years. In order to understand uh, the full picture, the, the, the homes and the data and the energy performance of the homes is, is one piece of the jigsaw. The, another piece is, is how it affects the, the residents, how much it's costing you to run, how, uh, what your options are around heating. So we will be this year um, undertaking a, a, a full uh, resident customer survey on, on energy efficiency and, and your energy costs. Okay. I think we'll come to questions in a second, sir. OK. So in addition to this drive with regards energy efficiency, this autumn, everybody will be receiving, all our customers will be receiving an autumn information pack, which will provide some really useful information about energy efficiency, also how to manage the home during the period around the autumn and, 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 and winter period. And this hopefully will also, with regards to condensation um, and also energy bills as well. So we're developing that at the moment um, and hopefully that'll be a useful bit of information. But again, it's something that we'll develop um, and it's something that we can learn from that if residents feel that more is needed, then we can add or reduce as needed, really. It's, as I say, it's a, a first venture of ours, and, but uh, we're, we're certainly willing to learn from it. So, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Does, does Jura have any policy on the removal of asbestos or blue asbestos from people's homes? I moved into sheltered housing about 18 months ago, and I asked what was, a, what, what was the, under the underlay, and they told me it was asbestos. So if I wanted to change my carpets, they're going to come into contact with that and will refuse to do it. So if asbestos is, and asbestos is in, is in many of our homes, and you, you quite often, uh, you quite correctly, sir, identify asbestos tiles under your flooring, OK? If you wish to replace your flooring, then we will arrange to have the asbestos removed. Brilliant. Thank you. OK. Can I just back that up? Just after the first lockdown, we had our bathroom replaced. And, yeah, Kira would come in and done the asbestos assessment and the company come in and removed it all. It was inconvenient because we had to go out for the day, but it was all done safely and was well managed. So about that gentleman, what you just said to that gentleman, you do do what you say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you happy with the bathroom that you had replaced? Um, I'll come back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're all about improving uh, these uh, properties i'm in the sheltered bungalows along newton road now we've got all of us have got cracks coming all over in our bedrooms bathrooms sitting rooms nobody's bothered to come to have a look to see what's going on and the cracks are on the outside of the property as well okay have, yeah. have you reported that to us yeah it's all been okay. reported, all been reported. Yeah. okay that's, um, that's over a year ago we yeah. reported that yeah okay i, I apologize Nothing's taken place. We can arrange for one of the property inspectors to come out and do a, a full survey for you, OK? Yeah, all right. And, and then we can pick those things up. Yeah, all right. There's another thing I would like to ask you. In the, I've been in this property, showered housing, for eight years, and it's like a dark hole walking in because we got trees at the back of the property, so i got to keep my electric on all day in the kitchen. The hallway is black unless you leave your bedroom, bedroom door open. The first property, when it was empty, Kuro had gone in and painted all the doors inside. So it brought the light back into the property. Well, I've asked to get it done. No, they won't. They said, no, you can't have it done. Unless you, unless you want to do it yourself. That is 14, 
Well, you could say 14 doors in a night, seven doors. Can't do it. So the, the internal decoration of your property is usually the, the responsibility of the resident to do. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Um, with regards to any, any tree overhang that may be then impacting on, on your light, we can certainly look at having some of that looked Yeah, but at, the problem okay. is anything that's grown in the back garden is all coming this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we're not getting no light in the kitchen. Sure. Yeah. No, you can't. I can, I can speak to, to our estates team to, to have them come and have a look at those trees for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll catch your name. They need your, to be cut name. right back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll catch your name at the break and we can, <laughs> we can look into that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Keith. Hi. You said that uh, you give a hand to people who are uh, moving their stuff out. I was at a disability uh, group the other evening and there was a lady on there who was having her kitchen done and she had to move the white goods herself or she couldn't have it done. And she was asked to repeat it and she said, if I don't remove the white goods from the kitchen, they refuse to do it. And I said, I'm sure Victor, Julie or Paul yeah. would love to hear that. Yeah. And she was going to send the email in to, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Tom or, because um, it was one of those groups. Okay. Now, that is disgusting. I, it's I beyond agree. disgusting. I agree. We, we, should be, we should be making it as easy as possible for customers to, to receive their uh, upgrades. And she was disabled. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will, I'll take that back, Keith. I'll have a chat with you later. But we should be, we should be providing that assistance. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions in the, uh, in the room? We've got a couple. Um, what is the Curo policy regarding smart meters? Is there a policy, a definite policy or not? There's, there's, there's not. The smart meter rollout is undertaken by the utility providers. So the, the, your, your electricity or gas provider would be the ones that you would need to speak to about having a smart meter installed. What about in same blocks of uh, flats and the, and the smart meters are outside the flats? So where the, we have... The meters. Yeah, so uh, the Carl, our uh, director of estates, he's up next and he is dealing with our energy uh, broker to roll out smart meters across the blocks. So the, the basically you are, you are in favour of smart meters? Oh, ab absolutely. absolutely. But what, what about um, all the uh, uh, research that has been done by people who think they're actually uh, in danger of people's health. There, there, are, there is a lot of research being done. Is there? It's, there is. It's not something I'm familiar with. You, I, can, I can give you a, a nice sheet of, uh, like quite a few sheets of paper with the information on it. Sure, Recognised sure. experts. Okay. okay, it's not something I'm familiar with, um, no. but I'd, I'd be welcome, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in, in having a look at the information you have. Okay, yeah. right. Uh, talking about smart meters, um, I can't help one put in because when I was uh, uh, when I was with SSE la uh, two years ago, uh, they told me that the chap come and had a look, but he couldn't put one in because there were so many wires in there he didn't know where they were going to. Right. Okay. Can I can I ask you something, sir? I got five electric meters in my cupboard. One of them is connected to the boiler. The rest of them don't work, and Curo will not take them out. Okay, usually the meter would be the responsibility of the utility yeah, provider. Yeah, that's sudden electric, and they, they said it's Curo. Okay, okay, I get, we, we can pick this up uh, in the break. I can take your details, and, and we can speak to the electrical manager. Okay. okay. I think you have one more question. Any news on what's happening with um, sort of communal area updates and and walls and windows. The outbound communication to our customers, is that what you're referring to? Sorry, the... So the Great Properties and Places project that was... Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the programme's online, so um, we will be at uh, your estate from uh, March and April. Awesome. You didn't say which year. No. <laughs> <laughs> didn't say which year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kiro 
are a big company and they've got a lot of properties. Where I live, underneath, there are about 60 garages. Now, car parking is tight all over town, everywhere, as you know. Why are you renting out garages for storage and not for people to put their cars in? Two, the, the area where I live is ideal for... Um, for renewable energy, have you got policy to uh, put up um, re uh, uh, re for renewable energy for all these places? And uh, we're talking about a car revolution. When are you going to uh, uh, electrify all the garages? Which means you've got to talk to the residents, to the people who are renting the garages, who are using them for storage which is against uh, your rules, isn't it? Uh, with regards to the garages, we do have a big stock of, of, of garage uh, across, across the area, and we are going to be having a look at what we do with those, those sites this year. Um, in terms of electrifying the garages, that may be an option. I think some do have some electric supply. Whether people rent them to store their personal belongings or their vehicle is, is entirely up to the, the person that, that rents that that spot. With regards to renewable energies, um, we will be looking at that at some point this year. Renewable energy at the moment is, is in its infancy. We, we have a number of uh, renewables across some of our homes and beca because technology is moving on so quickly, that what we currently have isn't, isn't that reliable. There's no, there's no obvious solution to any one type of our, our, our properties at the moment because we are at the start of a very, very long journey on, on energy efficiency and decarbonisation. So before, before we go and implement a range of solutions that, we, that don't work long term, we need to be very careful that we spend the money in the right places on the right things. OK? OK. <clears throat> I think we've got one more question at the front here. Yeah, you just about trees. Well, I'm living at Hannah Close. I wouldn't just be easily moved that by Hannah Close. We got we did talk to you about this two years ago before lockdown uh, about the trees and them coming up over the bank and moving shelter accommodation. You got you said we there's no money to come up there because it's shelter accommodation, but they still come up. I had but you thought it when I was in shop. And the outcome was that come back from you, and I don't understand why that you said you wouldn't do anything. So we've got a, uh, we've now got recently employed a, uh, a specialist tree surgeon, um, a surveyor, sorry, that will be able to. We'll, I'll get your details in the break just after this uh, session, and we can pass those details over so we can come and give you a, a better answer around that. Just say that I have spoke to the tree surgeon. Um, who was going around doing a mapping of the area, but basically said uh, they won't cut trees down regardless, what, regardless of the height of them because they're bare shit and the fact that they're right in front of the flats, which are Hyundai trees, which, as you all know, they grow, they grow mm. extreme height. And, I mean, they're way above the flats. And I, I've asked him about cutting them back and he said, we won't cut them back down. We just, we lob the tops. But they don't, they just lob the lower branches. And it's an ongoing battle. Every time I see him, he, I think he starts running now. I think what we can do is get a more definitive answer around that, uh, around the, the policy of, of, uh, of how we manage those trees. And we can get that uh, to you, no problem. I'll have a catch up with you in a moment after the break. We have a safety rail, hand rail, to walk down with. We can't use it because of all the bear poo. Already. And the moss, yeah. And also on the other side of Hannah Close, where the steps are, the steps are too high, the railings are too far away from the steps, and the railings are too low. Tom nearly went head over heels the other day when he went had to lean forward and over to get his hand on the rail. I said, just hold on to my shoulder, and I was struggling to hold the rail because mm. I've got fibromyalgia. So I'm trying to hold myself up as well as Tom down those steps. Yeah, safety is really important and what we can arrange is uh, one of Laura's surveyors, uh, we can get somebody out there to have a look at that for you uh, this okay. week to see what, the, uh, see what we can do to resolve okay. that for you. 
Cool. So, uh, one more question, sorry, oh. for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're on about energy efficiency during the properties, which we appreciate. But what about the insulation between sound barrier between each floor, uh, flats? Because where we are, you can hear virtually yes, everything from next door as well as people above you. So you're referring more to the soundproofing but rather than between the... yeah between right, each okay. flats, okay. which obviously goes on to the fire regulations as well. We can certainly have someone come out and see whether they they are appropriate or not. Um, the the soundproofing between the, the dwellings. We can have somebody come out and take take a look. Yeah, well, I don't think there is any. Yeah. Sorry. Also, the flats above us have got a long window where we've got the door leading out what is classed as our back door into the living room. But upstairs, I've got a long window. If there is a fire in any part of our flat, hope God there isn't, but if there was, the upstairs can't get out if it's covering the stairs. They've got a long window, which could be an escape route. Okay. That is why they moved me out. Yeah. Right. But yeah. there's still people that struggled. His brother struggled to get out. We, we, we would need to speak to our fire safety manager who would have to come and have a look at that. Okay. It's not something I would uh, be qualified to comment on. Okay. Yeah, thank you, very, thank you very much for all your questions and thanks for listening to us uh, this afternoon. Hope you have a good day.